Well, hey, good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you this morning. My name is Adam, and it's a joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to gather with you and worship with you, fix our eyes on Jesus together. And then one of my favorite things is we get to open up the Bible together every week when we gather together. And so uh, I would love it if you'd open up your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. That's where we're going to spend uh, most of our time today, although we are going to hop through uh, a couple different uh, scripture passages. And part of the reason for that is we're kicking off a brand new series called The Road to Redemption. Now, that's also funny because our church is named Redemption. So it's not how to get here, okay? It's bigger than that, okay? It's bigger than that because you made it here, so you already know the road to redemption. But I kind of have this thing that I feel like this year, maybe more than any other year for me, and maybe this is true for you too, that, that this whole like season has snuck up on me. Like Easter is just a couple weeks away, and it's earlier than it, than it normally is. And so I just wondered if it was worth our time to slow down and prepare our hearts for the celebration of resurrection. Now, uh, we, we talk about the gospel. We, we talk about the resurrection around here all the time. That's not like a one Sunday a year thing for us. And yet there's something kind of specific in, in our culture that gives us the opportunity to slow down and think about the final week of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection and all that that means for us. And so I thought over the next few weeks, what if we just kind of slowed down and we looked at holistically from all of the scripture, what this means to be saved or to be redeemed. Maybe maybe this, we'll answer this question over the next couple of weeks. Why is the good news of the gospel good news? Now, maybe to define a couple things so we're all on the same page, I would say this, the gospel, which literally means good news, is the good news that Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, died in our place for our sins and rose again eternally triumphant over his enemies, Satan, sin, and death. And because of that, there is now no condemnation for those who believe in Jesus, but through him and through him alone have eternal and everlasting joy. Like that's really the good news is that because of who Jesus is, because of what he has done and what he's promised us that he will do, that that we can be saved from our sin, that we can be reunited with the Father, that we can have what Jesus says is abundant life, life to the full, and that one day we would stand before God and we wouldn't be as sinful, but rather we would seen as righteous and we would be welcomed into the Father's house to spend all of eternity. Now, I've heard it said this way over the years. That for news to be good news, it has to invade bad spaces. You ever thought about that? For news to be good news, it has to be able to invade bad spaces, which means this. For news to really be good news, there has to be room for bad news. I think of it this way, kind of an interesting fact about me, is every couple years, I will enter a raffle, okay? Okay. Some people in the room get really, really frustrated by this. I don't. Every couple of years, I enter a raffle, and the reason I enter the raffle is because I'm really good at winning raffles, okay? Uh, in fact, I don't say that to be arrogant or prideful. I have won the same raffle more than one time, maybe more than twice, maybe three times, okay? I'm just saying the same raffle at the same place, I've won a few times. And I don't have an inside man or anything like that, but it goes something like this, is I see something that I want, but that thing that I want is probably not something that I would ever buy or even could afford to buy, but I can afford the raffle ticket. So I will buy one raffle ticket that gets associated to my name, and then I wait, because there is the potential for bad news, right? Like somebody else could win the raffle. So I would get an email that says, sorry, you lost, which in my opinion would be bad news. Or I could get uh, an email that says, congratulations, you won again, which then gives me the opportunity to email people who I love who get frustrated by me winning the raffle to say, guess who won again, right? Which is bad news for them, good news for me. But there's also room for something else to happen. Like what if you won something that you didn't really want, or you didn't consider to be good. Now, what I'm going to say next will be highly controversial to people in the front two rows. 
I don't know about the rest of you, but the front couple rows, there's a few people that will be offended. And welcome to Redemption Church. I'm just okay with that, okay? A couple years ago, I had the opportunity with my family to go to a Jelly Belly store. You know what Jelly Bellies are? They're like the, the jelly beans. And somebody decided that we needed millions and millions of flavors and expressions of jelly beans, and they named them the Jelly Belly. Now, I'm okay with most of this because black licorice jelly beans are disgusting. They just are. I know some of you love them. My, I have family members that love them. I just don't. I don't get it. And somebody kept that tradition alive in the Jelly Belly store. In fact, somebody who was either really, really bored or really, really creative created a surprise pack of Jelly Bellies. And in this pack, there are two Jelly Bellies of each kind, and they look exactly the same, but the flavors are significantly different. Now, just so you'll believe me, this is from their website. You can get Juicy Pear or Booger, okay? They look exactly the same, taste different. You can get Strawberry Banana or Dead Fish, okay? Peach or Barf, okay? I'm just reporting the news. Uh, Pomegranate or Old Bandage, okay? Disgusting. But then this is the one that confuses me the most out of all of this. Butter popcorn or rotten eggs. The reason this is confusing for me is because butter popcorn jelly bellies are disgusting. They're just as bad as the rotten eggs. It's It's a loss either way. They are disgusting. The worst thing that could happen to me is I could enter a raffle and win a lifetime supply of butter popcorn jelly bellies because they're disgusting and they're gross and they should not be eaten by anyone. Now, some of you I've been praying for because a few of you in the room on Facebook have shared that now stores are carrying dill pickle flavored jelly beans. You should avoid this at all costs. They cannot be good. They cannot be good and should be avoided. If you try it and say you like it, I'm assuming that you're lying to me, okay? I just, it can't be good. I mean, dill pickle, like sunflower seeds, are barely good. Okay, anyway, back to the message. For good news to be good, it has to be able to invade bad spaces. For good news to be really good, there has to be room for bad news. And so today, as we enter in this series called The Road to Redemption, we are talking primarily about the bad news. If you came to church this morning thinking like, I'm just going to be so encouraged and so filled up and so blessed, not this week. Come back next week, okay? Because we're talking about the bad news. And here's here's the bad news. Like, here's what you should know about us. We, like, believe in the Scripture. We believe this is the Word of God that is breathed out by God, that is for us, that is ancient. And because it is timeless, it is always timely. Okay, but we believe, at least I believe, that the Scripture is our highest authority, right? We take everything we read in Scripture and we say, like, this is God's Word to us. We really believe we get God's best when we say yes to His Word and His will. We believe that. And what the Bible says is that the world that you and I currently live in is not the world that God originally designed or intended for us to live in. See, the scripture would say something like this, the God who is perfect, holy, and all-powerful, and good, creates the world and everything in it, and it is good. Now, I want to talk about creation for for just a few minutes this morning, because we believe this. When we open up the book of Genesis, we believe that this is how the world was created. I believe these things about God. The first one is this, that God the Father is the author of creation. The God the Father who is perfect, holy, all-powerful, and good designs the world as we know it. Like as we read through Genesis chapter 1, we see it as God that says, let there be and there is, and it is good. Let there be light, let there be sky, let there be water, let there be stars and sun and moon, let there be animals, let there even be man, and it's good. We also see that in Scripture that Jesus the Son is the active force of creation. 
So why God the Father designs and authors the whole thing, it is through Jesus that all things are created. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is talking about Jesus. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, there was not anything made that was made. Paul would say it this way in Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I would take that to mean that the reason gravity was still in place this morning is because Jesus holds all things together. The reason the earth did not fall into the earth last night or the moon did not fall into the earth is because Jesus held the stars in the sky where they belong by his power. So we see God the Father is the author of creation. Jesus the Son is the active force of creation. And then we even see the Holy Spirit, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in creation. That the Holy Spirit is the personal presence of God that brings life. You open Genesis chapter one, it says the spirit of God hovers over the water. In fact, even when the the scriptures say in Genesis that God breathed, well, all throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is often translated or referred to as wind or breath. David would say it this way in Psalm chapter 33, verse six, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So he said, God the Father speaks, and it's through the Spirit that these things come to be then. That God's Spirit is the invisible power or breath that animates humans and creations. And what we see is all throughout Scripture is that when God creates in the beginning, it was good. You'll see this if you go home and read through Genesis 1 and 2, that God creates, and it is good, and God creates, and it is good. It's rhythmic, it's poetry, and it's there so that we would memorize it and grasp onto it. When God creates, he always creates good things. And what God creates is called Eden, the garden. And it's called paradise. I mean, that's really what Eden is, is when God creates the world and everything in it, and he places Adam and Eve in the garden as a place of paradise, a place of what the Bible would call shalom. It would be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And what you should know about the Garden of Eden is it literally is where the heavens or the spiritual realm meets the earth or the physical realm. I saw somebody diagram it this way, is that God is spiritual and exists in the heavenly realm. But there's also the physical earthly realm. The Garden of Eden is where the spiritual meets the physical, where God shows up on the earth and meets with flesh. And so in the garden, there would be this opportunity that all things were the way that God created them to be, that there was perfect unity in relationship with God. Like, I even think, and there's some debate about this, but I even think that Adam and Eve would have had not only a relationship with God, but they would have seen angels and other created beings in the garden. You're going to see room for that in a minute. It was perfect. It was absolute perfection. I mean, the, the Bible will use language like the lion would sit with the lamb, and there was no violence like you'd literally be like, hey, hey, what are you going to go do in the garden today? I don't know, I'm going to go pet the grizzly bears. Haven't seen them for a couple days. And there's no threat of injury. There's no threat of death. It is perfection. Now what will happen in the New Testament is, is this word, because of what we're going to talk about today, the garden in this same diagram would get replaced with the kingdom of God. Right? When Jesus comes in the flesh, they would ask, the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what's the kingdom of God? Where the spiritual heavenly realm meets the physical earthly realm. In fact, in Revelation, the last two chapters in Revelation gives us this idea of what heaven will one day be, is that when all things are done, when all things are where God wants them to be, he will take heaven and he brings it to this earth and recreates the garden, a perfect place, the spiritual heavenly realm and the physical earthly realm, and it will be like the garden, that it will be perfect paradise. 
In fact, in Hebrew, Eden literally means delight. Now I think, at least for me, so maybe this is true for you, because we have nothing to really compare this to in our own experience, I think it's hard for us to comprehend what Eden would really be like. I mean, you think about it, there would be no sickness. There'd be no shame, no suffering, no even thought of death. Like I I do this sometimes as my doctor has asked me to stop doing. But like sometimes like if I start feeling sick or I like have a weird pain in my body, I'll, I'll go to Google and Google the symptoms. Anybody else? And Google always says this, you're dying, right? I mean, that's the answer. Like, you have the common cold or you have 36 hours to live, right? And so then I call my doctor and say, I just got off Google. I'm probably going to die. Can I get in the next 36 hours? And he's like, I can see you in six months. I'm like, but Google says I have 36 hours. Adam never had a day like that. Like, Adam never had a moment where he faced sickness or, or soreness or, or death or injury, There's no government, no taxes. Like there's never a moment where Adam and Eve wonder if they have to lock the door at night. There's absolute serene security. And there's the most purest form of human relational intimacy and connectedness. Like no shame. No feelings of inadequacy. No feelings of like, do I need to hide or do I need to put on a certain persona to impress you so that you might like me. The language the Bible would use for this is that Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They could stand before God and they could stand before one another as they were and know that they were loved and accepted and they were good enough. But then there's this other thing that the scripture says is here is is what I would call purpose and partnership. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I mean, imagine this. Like, men in the garden. God creates Adam and puts him in the garden and says, listen, this place is perfect. This place is paradise. This place is the greatest place you could ever live. This is the place where heaven meets earth, where the will of God is being done fully in the physical realm. And there is so much potential. I think we miss this when we talk about the garden. There's so much potential. Like there's so much that could be. That God gives Adam authority in the garden and says, I want you to work it and I want you to keep it. And this is important because God creates us for work before the fall ever happens. That in the garden, Adam and Eve would wake up and work, but it was a blessing and it was a joy and it was fruitful. And there's so much potential that God creates and then partners with Adam and Eve. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply, start families, work, create, expand upon the potential that's here. And there's one rule in the garden. Stay away from that one tree. Like, just don't eat. Like, all the fruit is yours, all the animals are yours, all the land is yours. Like, I want you to be fruitful, I want you to be multiplying, I want you to work, and and, and just, I want you to have joy, but there's this one tree that's bad for you, there's this one thing that will kill you, avoid that, because if you eat it, you will surely die. Now, sometimes people will read that and say, well, why would a good God place a tree in the garden? And I think it's this. I think God put the tree in the garden to show us that obedience always brings joy in life. I mean, like, I don't think, like, listen, if somebody came to me and said, hey, God has created the perfect place, paradise, Eden, no sickness, no shame, no death, no reason to hide or to lie. Like, you'll actually be blessed in your work, and it'll be fruitful, and you'll be with God, and it'll be great. No shame, no sickness, no death. There's one thing. You just can't eat the fruit of one tree. I don't see that as overbearing. I'd be like, I'm in. 
Just show me where that tree is. And I, I'm like, I'll stay away from it. But I think God wants to show us and he wants to remind us that obedience always brings joy in life. Every day that Adam and Eve lived in communion with God and fellowship with God, it was a blessing. And what did they do? They just joyfully obeyed. We just did what God told us to do. And we stayed away from that tree until one day. Genesis chapter three, verse one says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And we have to talk about this for a minute. Because I think for a long time, churches have been unwilling to really like peel back the layers on this because it's like, we don't want people to be afraid or it's just easy maybe to do it another way. Maybe it's just because we don't fully understand what's taking place here. But this serpent is not a snake. Like forget everything you learned on the flannel graph, okay? When they put the snake up or in the cartoon or like a gardener snake that shows up and talks. This is not a snake, a snake did not walk in the garden and talk with, a, like, in the garden, right? If a snake was walking in the garden, it was what? A lizard, okay? Like, and so this is Satan. This is, this is our spiritual enemy. He is a created angelic being who is filled with pride, who rebels against God. In fact, the word Satan in Hebrew is actually the Satan, So as you would read this, it would say, now the Satan shows up. He's also called the adversary. We know his real name is Lucifer. It's called Star of the Morning. And just like Michael or Gabriel, Lucifer is a created angelic being by God who sees his glory and has the opportunity to partner with him and be with him. But here's what we know about Lucifer. He's an angel who is powerful He's beautiful. He actually holds a high-ranking position where he sees, oversees other angels and even cherubims. But we find out in scriptures that he becomes filled with pride. Instead of worshiping God, he wants to be worshiped as God. Instead of obedient, being obedient to God, he wants to give commands to other people who would then be obedient to him. Jesus, when he speaks about Satan, says this, when he speaks, he speaks lies. It's his native tongue. Jesus tells us in John 10 that Satan has one purpose. His purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now it's that Satan who shows up in the form of a serpent. And Revelation would even refer to him as a serpent or a dragon at times. He, he takes on a form to meet with Eve to deceive her. Genesis chapter three, verses five and six says, for he begins this conversation with her. And they're at that place. They're at that tree with that one fruit that they're not supposed to eat. And don't miss this. Eve is there and so is Adam. We have no idea what Adam is doing. Just not paying attention. I have no idea. I don't know if he's a little ADD. I don't know if like he's just looking at all the animals that God's created because God gave him the ability to name those like maybe he's like rethinking, you know, like, I don't know, should, should I call that a turkey or is there a better name? You know, something flies by and he's like, oh, but, but, butterfly. I mean, we don't know, but he's there. And this is what Satan says to Eve. He's talking about the fruit and he's like asking her to question, like, did God really say? Like, did God really mean? And then he says this to her, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So Satan starts this deceptive conversation with Eve. And the first thing he gets her to do is question God's word. Did God really say, did God really mean? And then, and then he really gets his hook in her and says this, God is trying to hold you back. Like, you know what you want, and you know what God wants, and there's a gap there, and the reason there's a gap there is because God is lying to you. He's actually trying to keep you from something. In fact, God doesn't want you to do this because he knows that if you do it, you'll actually be happy or satisfied. Here's the lie he tells her. Eve, if you do this, you could be like me. Like, you could become your own God. 
Like you would know as much as God knows. You would have the right over your life to be your own master, your own commander. You'd have the knowledge that you need, and you should do this. So chapter, or chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. There's this process that happens here. She sees it, she gets focused on it, and it begins to stir up desire and appetite in her. Now, we we don't know for sure, but I think this. I think Eve begins to wonder, maybe paradise could be better. Like, maybe if I listen, like, maybe, you know, there's one thing I don't have in paradise. I've never tasted that fruit. There's one thing I don't have in paradise, that knowledge that God said will, will kill me, but I still lack it, so maybe... Maybe life would be better. Like maybe I would be happier. Maybe I would be satisfied. And now she begins to desire it. She has an appetite for it. She wants it. And don't miss this. Eve now has an appetite and a desire for the very thing that God told her would kill her. This is why this is so important. This is the same way this still works for you and I today. Satan shows up and says, did God really say? Did God really mean me? Isn't there a gap between what you want and what his word says? And you should pay attention to that because maybe God's lying to you. Maybe God's holding you back. Maybe he knows that if you experience this, you would actually be satisfied. Or maybe paradise could be better only to lead you to the thing that God promised you would eventually kill you. So Eve takes and eats and then hands the apple to Adam. It's probably not an apple, but in my mind, it's an apple. Hands the fruit to Adam, and Adam, who's still looking at the animals, just takes a bite. And verse 7 says, The eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Like, it's all downhill from here. For the very first time, Adam and Eve felt exposed ashamed, and the need to hide from one another. It gets worse. Verse 8, And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So Adam and Eve not only feel the need to hide from one another, they now feel the need to hide from the God who created them and gave them life and put air in their lungs, and who created this whole place for them. And so God starts a conversation, not not because he's unaware, he doesn't know, but he's seeking them out, and he asks them, why are you hiding from me? You've never hid from me before, why are you hiding now? And Adam and Eve respond, because we're naked and we're afraid. And God, not because he doesn't know, but because he's giving them a chance to come to him, says, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat. And now we begin to see the brokenness, the cancer of sin, the cancer of rebellion spreading so quickly. The first thing that Adam does is he blames God and he blames Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Don't forget, God, you created this one. Remember, you took that whole rib out. You did that whole thing in the ground. You, breathed, you like, gave breath her and you gave her to me. Remember, this, you designed her and you gave her to me. She just handed me some fruit. I was naming a butterfly. I don't know what happened. So it's really your fault and it's her fault. Eve then blames Satan. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman answered, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Here's what you have to know about God. God is so holy. And God is so good that he cannot tolerate sin. Because it is not in his nature. It's against his character. It goes against everything that he is. Which is why he created the garden the way he did. He created Eden to represent his goodness, his personality, his character, and his will. And sin, and sickness, and shame, and death, and separation were not a part of that because they are not a part of him. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. 
And on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I would suggest to you that God is not telling a snake, it will now be a snake. What God is telling Satan is that he is now cast down and cast out. And remember, Lucifer is the son of the morning saw. There's beautiful, angelic. Some people would translate that to think that he led worship in, in heaven, that he was in God's presence, ruling and reigning over God's kingdom because God had given him things. And what God says is, you are now cast out of my presence. You are cast out of Eden. And what you get from this day forward is death. And that's all you get. You will rule over death. You will be the king of death until you are defeated in death, and then you will be locked in hell forever, which is eternal suffering death. You can read more about this in Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah 14. And then for the very first time, we see the hint of the gospel. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise you your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Like right in the garden, God the Father speaking to Satan, speaking to Adam, he says, there is one who is coming, O king of death, and you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. You will be defeated. There is one who will come and defeat you and restore what has been broken. There is one who is coming who is bigger and stronger and better our King of kings, our Lord and lords, who will defeat Satan and therefore will defeat sin, shame, and death and restore things to the way that God always wanted them to be. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Verse 17, And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Here's what happens in this moment. Creation, as originally created, designed and authored by God, the original intent of creation is now reordered and fractured. What was easy and enjoyable is now difficult and painstaking. What was one piece is now marked by chaos. Paradise will be protected And Adam and Eve will go live in unrest. Intimate relationships will be marked by rebellion, mistrust, and distrust. Rest will be replaced with violence. Wholeness has become fractured that we would feel incomplete and inadequate. All pain is magnified. And remember, Adam was created for work before the fall. Now his work is less enjoyable and is exhausting because now his work works against him. This is why, guys, you try hard not to get those dandelions in your yard. And they come back every year. When you plant your garden and then you want it to be perfect and those things come up in your garden, the thorns, the thistles, the weeds, why? Because the curse. And then he says this, by dust you came, now dust you will return. For the very first time, Adam and Eve Hear that they now will die. That all of a sudden, things that were never an option for them are like sickness, pain, difficulty, unrest, and death. See, God's original intent for you and for me is that we would live as his image bearers, giving him glory, living for his purposes in a place called paradise. 
But because of that rebellion, because of that sin that our first parents, Adam and Eve, participated in, we are all separated from God. We are all separated from one another. We now all experience pain, sickness, death, fear, and decay. And it is not just physical death. It is spiritual death. Now, now here's the thing. I get this. There may be some of us in the room or even watched online that be like, listen, you, you are making some huge assumptions off of a, a Bible story. You're like, man, you're, you're like creating a world order off of a, a garden that you say was perfect and like a, a snake showed up and, and ruined everything. And man, I, I don't know if I can buy into that. And I'd say, okay. Like I do because I believe the scripture is real and is the word of God for us. But let's just be honest for a second. Like, if we had to just step away from this for a second, wouldn't you say you know this to be true in your heart? Like, every time an innocent child dies, isn't there something inside of you that goes, it should not be like this? Every time you attend a funeral, isn't there something in our hearts that go, this is odd. Like, this whole thing is weird. And it is, because we were never intended to see death. Like every every time that there's some sort of crisis or some sort of, of, you know, mass thing that happens, whether it's a shooting or a war or genocide, I mean, like we partner with Haiti. Do you see what's going on in Haiti right now? Like the prime minister who's drove, like, drove in Haiti to the brink of disaster, protected himself and left, and literally the whole nation is being overtaken by gangs. And then there's something inside of us that goes, it should not be this way. And here would be my question, where does that come from? Like if we all were just primordial scum that somehow by chance evolved from monkeys, then where would we get the idea that anything should be anyway? Maybe think about this. Have you ever realized that every single person is pursuing paradise? You ever thought about this? Every single person is pursuing paradise. Like, I'm not trying to get political. I'm just trying to be real. Like, what are Democrats promise you if you vote for them? Paradise. Like, if you get our laws in place and you do it our way, you know what you get? A better America, paradise. What do Republicans promise you? Listen, if you do our policies and you do it our way, like, what are are you going to get? You're going to get paradise. What do libertarians promise you? If you do it our way, you'll get free weed and paradise. I mean, like, you know what I mean? It's just... Right? I mean, isn't that the whole thing right now? Like, if, if people tell you to go veg, like vegan and vegetarian, what do you get? Paradise. And all of us that like meat say, you can have it, and we'll keep eating the meat. Right? You ever thought about this? What's the point of socialism? Paradise. Like, what's the point of atheism? Well, if we could just get rid of religion, the world would be better. Like, everybody's pursuing paradise. And here's my question. Where does the idea of paradise come from? Why would we think that it's even possible? And I would suggest to you it's this. That the Ecclesiastes says that eternity is set in our hearts. That there's actually a piece in all of us that remember we were created for something better and more. And Romans chapter 8 says, all of creation groans and cries out for the world to be restored to the way that it was. Here's how Paul says it in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. For since indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there was no law. Yet, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So here's Paul's argument. He's talking to Jewish people, and he goes, listen, the law, the commandments of God, did not create a world where sin is possible. That happened in the garden. 
all the law did was expose sin. So he's going, even from Adam through Moses, before we got the law, sin existed, right? Adam and Eve have a couple boys, Cain and Abel. One kills the other one, like, I mean, right in the beginning, and they used rocks to do it, and God asked them almost the exact same questions. He asked Adam and Eve, and he goes, listen, sin exists because it entered the world through Adam and Eve, and like a plague, like a cancer, it affects all of us. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace by the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So Paul is going to make this argument. He's going to say, Adam... Through Adam enters sin and rebellion and death, and we are all children of Adam. But then he's going to say there's Jesus. And through Jesus, Jesus will undo what Adam did. So just like through Adam all have sinned, when we come to Jesus, that sin is undone. Look at what he says in verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness that reigns in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedient, there were many who were made sinners. So by the one man's disobedience, many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that, As sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen, those under Adam, those who have not received Jesus, those who have not responded, here's what we get through Adam. We get sin, death, condemnation, unrighteousness, disobedience, and hell, eternity apart from God. That is the bad news for all of us. The butter, popcorn, jelly bean in the room doesn't taste good. Is that we have all been marked by sin. Because of Adam and Eve and because of our own rebellion, our sins of omission, doing the things that we should do but don't, and sins of commission, doing the things that we shouldn't do and we do them anyway, we've all sinned. And because we've all sinned, we fall short of the glory of God. But there is good news. But we're going to talk about that more next week because this Sunday is all about the bad news. But here's the implication. Here's what I would say. Because we have a sin issue, our problem cannot be fixed by morality, government, religion, trying harder, becoming better, doing more, or just pulling up your bootstraps. Like becoming a better version of yourself isn't going to fix this. Getting another degree isn't going to fix this. Trying to do more good works isn't going to fix this. Attending another parenting class isn't going to fix this. Because we have a sin issue that is both physical and spiritual, we need one who can rescue us, who can save us, We need one who will defeat the enemy that we cannot defeat, restore what has been lost, and conquer the power of Satan, sin, and death. Now, I'm not against any of those things. I'm just saying none of those things lead to redemption. And see, I believe the gospel is good news. And the reason that it is good news is because there is bad news. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you in the great name of Jesus, and we thank you for today, even though it is a a hard word on a good day. And God, we do thank you that you always tell us the truth about ourselves, and you always tell us the truth about you. And God, I do praise you and thank you that you came 
to rescue us, that you came to save us, that you came to make us new and set us free. And so God, maybe in a moment like today, we sit in the heaviness and we just repent and say, we're sorry. God, we're sorry for thinking our way is better than your way. We're sorry for thinking that we should be the master and commander of our lives and only you should be the one leading and ruling in our lives. God, forgive us for looking at the things that you've forbidden for us, for desiring them, for thinking that you're keeping us from things, Lord. I pray that you would help us to know your truth so that we would not be deceived, but we would get life and life to the full that comes only through Christ alone. God, I do praise you and thank you that you are with us now in this place. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to lead us and guide us. And God, I pray that maybe even in this moment, even though we've only talked about the bad news this morning, God, that that maybe today would be the day of salvation for someone in the room or online who would say, I need Jesus. I need this problem to be fixed. I need to be restored. I need to be made new. I need to be saved. And none of the things of the world can do that, but Christ and Christ alone can do that. So God, we thank you that you do save us. And we thank you that you have promised us that in Christ, paradise will be restored. That even on this earth, we can experience the kingdom of God. That we can have life and life to the full. That we can see expressions of your kingdom, like people being healed, people being set free, people growing in their identity, people breaking the chains and the bonds of addiction and anxiety and fear because Jesus has come and he's conquered. God, I pray that even now you'd do that in the room, that you would lead us to your life and your goodness and your presence. God, we praise and you thank you that there's better days ahead. That for those of us that believe this is as close to hell as we will ever get because you are building rooms for us in your Father's house, which is paradise. So Jesus, we ask that you'd be with us. God, I pray that you would be magnified in our hearts and our minds that we would respond in such a way that we wouldn't desire sin or things of the world. But God, would you stir up for us an appetite where all we would desire, that all that would satisfy, the only thing that would give us life and joy is you, Jesus. May we taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus, we ask this in your name, the name above all names. Amen.